chapter 20, verses 45 through chapter 21, verse 4. And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Grass withers, flower fades, word of our God stands forever. Hypocrisy is a fight that is always being waged within any religious group. As soon as you have any sort of external observances that should be done, there comes the chance for those observances to be completed, to be done, apart from any real devotion, any true devotion. As soon as the command to love God comes in and comes to light, the possibility of hypocrisy is then born because hypocrisy is not always something you can just externally observe. You can't just always look and tell whether hypocrisy is being committed. And what I mean is you can, you can tell other people, your friends, that if they love their friends, they'll invite them to church, right? So if you really loved your friends, you'd invite them to church. And then if the person that, if you're saying to, you should invite your friends, if you love them, you'll invite them to church. If that person then goes and doesn't invite their own friends to church, they are a hypocrite, right? Because they've said this is something you should do, but they aren't doing it. That makes them a hypocrite. But there's a, there's a sense in which you can say to your whoever, you should invite, if you love your neighbor, you'll invite them to church. And then that person goes and invites their friends and might still be a hypocrite. They might still be a hypocrite because they may be inviting their friends to church only for the reasons they can go back to their friend and say, I invite my friends to church and you should too. And that they, their motive for inviting their friends has not been that they actually want them to come in and love their friends. Their motive has just been so that I can brag about I'm the, person who, I'm the kind of person who invites my friends to church. And they are in the same way a hypocrite as the person who says you should do something and doesn't do it because their motive is in an entirely wrong place. If that's the reason why you did it, you're just as much of a hypocrite. If it's just for some self-serving reason, it's, it makes you just as much as a hypocrite. It doesn't matter just what you do, but also the motivation and heart behind what you do. This is not just what you do, but the heart and motivation behind what you do and what you do. And in our text this morning, Jesus is giving a warning to those who are just about a show. A warning to those who are just about putting on a show. The last three verses here of chapter 20 are this warning. It says, in the, in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, beware. Okay, so it's, this is a warning. Be afraid. Worry about. Beware of what? These scribes. He tells them to be aware of these certain teachers of the law. There's a group of people who like to make a big show of their greatness, right? They, they walk around in these big robes. They love to be greeted in the marketplace. They love the seats of honor. They love to be celebrated in public. They like to have impressive verbal rants. They go on and on in their prayers. They, they, like, to, they like to be up front and go on and on and on in their prayers. And Jesus is saying there's there's the, these people, they, they have these rants, and this is not good. They're, we're to be afraid of them. But we have to ask, is there something just wrong with the things that they're doing? Is it wrong 
to wearing long robes. I would argue probably, yeah, it's kind of weird and gross to wear a long robe around. But, but they're that, that's, out of, that's out of context. Is it wrong to wear like official dress? These are the people who are walking around in their official dress. So then it would be the question, is it wrong to dress nice? Is it wrong to wear what's considered proper attire? It wouldn't be wrong for me to wear a suit. When I get ready for a funeral and I put on a suit, sometimes on a Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, I might put on a suit. And is it wrong then because I'm putting on an official dress? Is it wrong to get the seat of honor? Is it wrong to show up to a meal and, then, and to be honored by have people that appreciate who you are and respect you and, and say, come sit up front. Is that in and of itself wrong? Is it wrong to pray long prayers? Now, some of you might say, yes, Darren. I think I've heard some comments from some kids uh, yeah, yeah, with their parents care, pray a little too long. The kids say, you pray as long as Darren does. <laughs> and so... It, but I've got it. And now some, so some might say, yes, there's something wrong with praying so long. But that, that, that is not the issue, is not the actions. If you look at verse 47, these men, they devour widows' houses. They're taking advantage of, of those, who are, uh, those who are in trouble. They take advantage of people. But then they make their long prayers. How? For a pretense. The NIV says, for a show. They say the long prayers. So their prayers are not, it's, nothing, it's not that they're wrong with making long prayers, sorry. But the problem is that if their long prayer is just so they can kind of see how long I can pray, aren't I impressive? They're making a pretense of, look at me, look how impressive I am. I can out pray everybody. I can put everybody to sleep with my prayers. Aren't I incredible? They're, they're, they're putting on a show. The reality is, God sees the heart of an individual and judges men by that truth. God judges by looking at the heart. This is, we could go several places. I won't make you drag around, but if you look at like a place like 1 Samuel chapter 16 in the picking of King David, uh, Saul has been chosen as a king. He's now rejected by God. Samuel's going around looking for the next king and he shows up. He's led to the family of Jesse and he's going and he's looking at these sons. And verse 6 of, of 1 Samuel chapter 16 when they came, well, this is all the sons of Jesse without David. They'll call him later. When the time came, verse 6, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Because this guy was impressive. This was a nice, tall, good-looking young man. Surely this is the king. It's why Saul was chosen as king, because he was impressive on the outside. Verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God does not judge by what you show. He judges by what is inside of your heart. He looks at the heart. John chapter 2 is um, the, the next gospel back. We see this very thing with Jesus. In John chapter 2, verse 25 Starting in verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. These people are making a show of Jesus, you're a great teacher, aren't something great's going on here, but Jesus doesn't give himself over to them. He doesn't submit himself to their praises because he knows what's going really going on inside. He knows what's going on inside. And he said basically the same thing in Luke chapter 16, verse 15, that this one of these parables we've gone through, but the... You are, he says to these Pharisees, the lovers of money, and they heard all these things, they're making fun of Jesus. Verse 15, he said to these teachers, these Pharisees, you are those who justify yourselves before men. How do you justify yourself before men? You put on long robes, make a long pretense with prayers. You kind of, you show up and you strut your stuff. You get all the seats of, at the fine tables. You have justified yourself before men, but God knows your hearts. 
For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So this is a theme throughout our scripture that God is not impressed by our show. It's our big idea for this morning, our uncomplicated big idea. God is not impressed by our show. He looks at the heart. God is judging and looking at what is inside of a man. We need to give close attention to our hearts and our motives because Jesus says those with false motives will receive a more severe condemnation, right? Those who make a pretense with their long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation, verse 47 says. They'll receive a more severe condemnation. Now, in order for that to make any sense to us, we have to have a few things in place in our minds. The first thing we have to have in place is we have to know there is condemnation for wrongdoing. In God's economy, justice must be done. God is a just God. He is a just judge. Any judge that we had up on the, behind the bar up making rulings, who every criminal you put in front of them, they just let them all go scot-free, we would immediately throw that judge off of the bench and get someone who was just. God is a just God. He must rule righteously. He must rule against transgression. God is a just God. He will not just wipe away transgression. That means every sin must be punished or God is not a just God. Condemnation is right for sin against him. He must Punish it. So there is condemnation for wrongdoing. We have to understand that. The second thing we have to understand is that there are some offenses that are worse than others. Now, that's a controversial statement when I say some sins are worse than others because they're pretty much, if I were to ask you before we started, you would all say, and, and you would, most of us would say that we are all sinners and no sin is worse than any other. You've probably said that. I say that from time to time, that no sin is worse than any other. And in one sense, that's absolutely right, okay? In one sense, that's absolutely right, that no sin is worse than any other, in the sense that every sin is worthy of, of condemnation. Every sin against an infinitely holy God is worthy of just punishment, so in that sense, no sin is worse than any other. They all deserve the judgment of God. And so, yes, you can say no sin is, worth, is worse than any other. No matter what the specific rebellion is, it is all rebellion before an infinitely worthy creator. So in that way, yes, no sin is worse than any other. But to say that and to mean that no sin is more wicked than any other sin, sin is not necessarily true. To say that and to mean that no sin is more wicked than any other sin is not true. We usually get that idea from a place um, like Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, where he in Matthew chapter 5, where he says, if you uh, hate your brother with your heart, basically you're, you're a murderer. That's what uh, 1 John 3, 15 says. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. The argument is that they are both equally condemning, but the question is, are they both uh, having the same level of condemnation? And if you think about it, that can't be right. If that were true, I think our world would just devolve into mass <laughs> sinfulness because of the reality of, of if, if that were the case, then every time I got angry at you, I might as well just go ahead and murder you because I've already, I've already done it in my heart. So I guess it's not any worse for me to get angry at you and be mad at you. Well, I've already murdered you in my heart, so I'm guilty of murder. So why not just go ahead and get rid of you, solve myself the problem. It's not going to happen in the future. So I'm just going to, now, that's absurd, right? There are differences. Now, they're both condemnable by God because we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I've broken the commandment by hating my neighbor which is the same condemnation, I just as well have murdered him, but it isn't as though I have actually murdered him. You, you understand what I'm saying? That, that there is differences in these sinful behaviors. Parents are much happier 
If their child gets mad at the sibling and pounds the floor and stomps to the room and screams into a pillow, it's not great. We don't like them to get mad, that angry. But it's better than beating up on their sibling, right? I think, yes, it is. I, I, I would, yes, I would much rather have Joel get angry and scream into a pillow and get mad than to go fisticuffs with his little sister, right? They, they are not the same. Neither one of them makes me necessarily happy, but, but, but they are different. And if you're still struggling with that, imagine the husband pleading with his wife that it only made sense to go ahead and, and commit adultery because he'd already thought about it in his heart. And see how far that actually gets the marriage, right? It's like, well, we were watching that show last night, and, and, uh, and, and it, I, was, it was a, I shouldn't have been watching the show. We shouldn't have been watching it, but it kind of compromised my, uh, my thoughts inside of myself. And so what I did is I sought the actress out. I got her number. I took her on a date, and, and we went ahead. Since I'd already committed adultery in my heart, I went ahead and committed adultery. No, no wife is going to be like, no. Oh, it, they're different, right? So there's the difference in these condemnations. You see what I'm saying. Firstly, we need to see there is condemnation. Secondly, that there are things that create more severe condemnation. And we thirdly need to see that it is those who practice religion, false religion, will have a greater condemnation. That's, so when all of these, what's, what is... What is uh, Hated in the sight of God, these scribes practicing false religion will, sh- will have a severe, a greater condemnation. Why is this? Because those who put on a show with no heart, they know the actions to go through. They, they, they know what they should be doing, but they have no motive or no real heart behind it. They are They are exposed to the truth, but they aren't letting it actually affect them. They're not responding to the light that they actually have. These these scribes would have known of God. They would have known of the coming Messiah. They should have seen Jesus and recognized him. They should have responded to the light that they had. But instead, what they did is they kept up all the airs of pretending like they had the light and did not let it actually affect them. They were putting on a show. And Jesus says that that sort of thing brings a greater condemnation because you're exposed to the truth, but you're not letting it actually affect you. If you sit week in and week out with an exposure to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you talk about Jesus, you know the story of the cross, you share it with your friends, but and on and on we could go, you bring your kids to Sunday school, you're trying to get other kids to come to kids club, all these things, you're engaged in all these activities, but you don't love him yourself, you are in serious danger because you are the person putting on pretenses whose heart is far from him. It'd be far better to not know anything of him than to know him and yet to reject him. So that's the negative side of this reality, this false religion. Jesus says that's a greater condemnation because they know the truth, they know the light, and yet they are not letting it actually affect them. That's the negative side. The positive side, quickly, is with this widow, this widow's might, the story of the woman. She's performing religious activity. Now, I want you to see that. Because it's often billed this way. Being religious, Jesus hates. And then what? Being irreligious, Jesus loves? No. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the point. The, the widow is still bringing her offering to the temple. She's still putting her money in the plate. She's still involved in, quote unquote, religious ob- observance. But she's doing it with a motive of love. It is, it is her motive that is different. It isn't just that Jesus hates religious activity. Jesus hates all false religious activity, all empty religious activity that has no true love involved in it. She's, she's coming. She's, she's doing it kind of poorly, actually. I mean, she's not really, she's bringing just a couple of coins, these two, two small copper coins. She's doing this religious duty, performing it poorly, but she is the one commended. She's honored by Jesus because she's responding rightly to the knowledge that she had. God was worthy of her very best. And so she brings it. In fact, she gives all that she has. She has two coins, 
would have been fine probably to give him one and keep one. She gives them both. The, the motive, the heart behind this. Do you see the, the contrast there? Doing all these great, huge things. No love for Jesus. No love for God. Just this small, simple observance but with a heart that truly does love God. The, one, the widow is the one who receives commendation, and the Pharisees, the religious, the scribes, they receive the condemnation. Those, there are those who give way more than her, but out of a lesser motive, they do not receive the praise. God is not impressed with our show. He looks at the heart. This is what matters most which is what should make us nervous. <laughs> that should make us a little on edge. If God is not impressed with our show, he looks at the heart. We are not, should not be comforted by that. Now today, that's popular, right? I got lots of people that I talk to that say, well, I've done all kinds of bad things, but God knows my heart. And so therefore, I think I'm going to be okay because God knows that in my heart, I'm, I, I'm really okay. That's, that's, people are comforted by that truth. But they either, if you're comforted by the, by the thought that God looks upon your heart, if you're comforted by that, you either A, don't know your heart very well. You don't know yourself very well and how, how well, I, I was going to use the word wicked, but how, how pulled you are in many different, how self-serving you are. You either don't, if you're comforted by the idea that it's good that God looks at your heart, you either don't know yourself very well or B, you don't understand how holy God really is, how perfect and righteous and just and pure God is. Either you don't know yourself or you don't know how pure God is and then how far those two things are apart or you don't know either one of them. You have a horrible, you don't understand yourself very well, and you have a very low view of the holiness of God, so you think, hey, it looks at my heart, and everything's okay. You first must realize you are far worse off than you think you are. We are far worse off than we think you, you, we are. Our motives, your motives, have never for a single second of your life been totally committed to Christ. Uh, total, I'm talking 100%. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, you've never committed that for, you've never done that for a second of your life. In your purest moment, you have never lived up to God's perfect standard of righteousness and of holiness. But let's just say, okay, Darren, you always want to beat up on people. Okay, so let's just say you could pull off one day. Let's say one day you nailed it and you were totally committed. You, you loved him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You were perfect. One day you did not fall short of perfection. Let's pretend, first of all, you're delusional. But let's just say you did. Is your white load of white clothes any less pink because it was only one red sock that you put in there? No. No. It's pink, they come out pink clothes, whether it's one white shirt with a bunch of red stuff, or if it's a bunch of white stuff with one little red sock. I've got these field notes journals that I carry around, and I had a red one, and sometimes they get washed because I don't clean my pockets out very good. It's a source of, it's a source of struggle at my house, yes. I, sometimes I fail to clean my pockets out. And I now have a pair of khaki shorts that are pink. Because I failed to take out the red book. It was just one little red, they're little tiny notebooks that I had in the back, but it's, let's say the whole load is white, but just the one day was wrong. The one thing that was pink in there, it ruins the whole thing. God demands perfect righteousness. Your sin has ruined you and has earned you just condemnation. You are far worse off than you think, but secondly, I want you to know God loves you far more than you deserve. Because you're far worse than you realize, God loves you far more than what you deserve. And that's because no one deserves rescue. We don't deserve it at all. That's the whole meaning of grace. You deserve the condemnation, but God gives grace. The Father sends the Son to save us from our sins, not because you and I deserve it, but because he decides to do it in his mercy and his grace. There is one person who is perfect in his motivations, and it is God himself. 
He is perfect in his motivations and in his desire to show his own goodness and mercy. He elects a people to save them by the sacrifice of his son. Not because they are special in and of themselves or they have merited his love and affection. But because he has set his affections upon them to save them. Jesus, by his sinless life and his death upon the cross, removes the condemnation that is deserved for all who look to him in repentance and faith. So firstly, far worse than you think you are. Secondly, you're far more loved than you know because God saved you, though you did not deserve it. And so thirdly, this means as Christians, we still fight every day for him to be uppermost in our affections. Rejoicing when by his grace, God is honored and obeyed and grieving and repenting when we fail because we do fail. Don't listen to those out there who tell you you can be holiness and perfection. We do fail. Your affections are not perfected. We live in this tension, a Romans 7 kind of tension where our sinful flesh is still at war with this renewed spirit within us. So we fight We seek to put to death the deeds of the flesh by the power of the Spirit, Romans 8 says. We pray for help that we would love him and with the pure love that he deserves. And we repent when we know we have fallen short. Because God is not impressed with our show, he looks at our hearts, that produces in the Christian a consistent attitude of repentance. Father, forgive me. I did not love you like I should have today. In this moment even, my heart is pulled this way and that way. Father, forgive me. And rejoicing then because we know the gospel. And when you repent and cry out forgiveness, he is there to save, to forgive, and to sanctify us. This can only be done when we live a conscious life, an aware life, an awake life. As Christians, we are called to be alive and awake to these sorts of realities. We should seek to be understanding why it is that we do what we do, and then working hard to see Christ honored in every area of our life. Every Sunday, we give you a chance to work hard at that. We offer communion. Every Sunday, we put out for display the broken body of Jesus Christ in the bread, the shed blood of Christ in the cup, in the juice. The offer of communion is a call to come awake to the reality of our life. Come awake to the reality of who you are. You are a sinner in need of saving. You are a sinner who's pulled in a thousand ways by different motivations. And what you need is forgiveness. What we need is help. What we need is rescue. The offer of a communion is a call to come awake to the reality of who you are and then also of who God is and what he has done. Because we are in a desperate state for rescue, Here is what God has done. He has sent his son to take upon himself the wrath that we deserve. Do not come to communion as a show. If you're listening, you know what this is about. You know what the communion service is about. Do not come as a show. We are celebrating the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for sinners. If you do not believe yourself to be a sinner or Jesus to be your savior, you ought not to make a show of believing it because you'll receive a greater condemnation. But if you do believe, this morning, right now, we can practically apply our sermon. Right now, you can practically apply the sermon that as we are singing the Gloria Patri in preparation for communion, as we are reading the words of institution, as we are praying the prayer, as we are getting in line, prayerfully thinking, Father, my motivations are pulled every which way. Help me this morning. Knowing, got repenting of your divided motives and knowing that God is not impressed with our show. He looks at the heart and what he better find there is Christ. What he better find there is faith in Jesus Christ. He'll never find, apart from going to glory, your perfective motives. We'll fight for that every day. But what he better find there is faith in Christ and what he has done. God is not impressed with our show. He looks at the heart. May he find Jesus there. Let's pray. Father, help us in this place this morning. We desire, I desire that you would be honored with our lives and that we would live lives motivated, have a purity of heart, God, to see you glorified and honored. Yet I know, God, I fail at this day after day 
And what I need, what we all need, Father, is your help. We need your forgiveness, God. We need the blood of Jesus Christ, remembering that we are washed white as snow. And then in the joy of that renewed hope, restoring to us the joy of our salvation, as David says in Psalm 51, as that joy of our justification is renewed, we walk out, Father, emboldened, empowered, filled with your spirit, that we might purify our motives to love you as you deserve to be loved, not putting on a show, but God, knowing that you're looking at our hearts and what you see there is the blood of Jesus Christ that has redeemed us and reconciled us to you. Pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.